Today is the first day of the August 90 seven day retreat at Springwater. There are a number of people here who have not been to a retreat here before. There are people here who have come for a second retreat or maybe for a tenth, fiftieth, maybe a hundred. And we will talk again as we always do on the first day of retreat about authority about listening to a talk. How does one listen to a talk such as these talks during the coming seven days? And what is our relationship with each other? One may have heard this before or read about it, read a talk in which this topic came up. And yet, can the mind in listening now be fresh? Not just in listening, but in talking. Not to try to remember what was said before and repeat it, but look at the problem and talk out of looking at the problem or the listening. Listening doesn't need to be a problem. Authority is a problem. And the influence of authority on our relationship, that can be a problem. But is listening a problem? listening to the rain? Does that present a problem? It doesn't, does it, when the mind has all the time and space to listen. Nothing pressing it to do this or that, to interpret, to write an essay about it. There's no pressure to do anything with it, to know anything about it. Then what is this listening? to the rain, when one doesn't even know what rain is, the word. Is it separate from the one who is listening, from the one who is sitting here? Or is there just this outpour? Separation does happen the moment thought arises or continues about me listening or having to listen or not listening as well as maybe all the rest of the people. When thought arouses doubt, am I really listening properly? Am I separated? With this, the separate listener is created and sustained. There are other, other things that feed into it, other ingredients. So, to all the verbiage, 
thoughts, feelings that go on in the mind about the separate listener, can that also be listened to, come into awareness, and therefore not be of great importance? In listening to what is being said here right now and has been said, is that a problem to listen and to listen to the words, to the meaning of the words, to move with it with one's total being and the rain being there too? Is that a problem? It becomes a problem when the mind says, well, what should I really listen to, to the rain or to what she says? But both are occurring at the same time. And a mind which is not directed by commands to do this rather than that, which is just open, open. Can there be listening to the words, looking at what is being said, and the rain being there too? Goodness knows where, one doesn't know where it is, it's everywhere. If this presents a difficult problem, then just to listen to what is being said and let the rain take care of itself. And what we're asking is, can a talk such as this be listened to as though one heard it for the first time? seeing how comparison to what one has heard before or what other people have said come into the mind, seeing how the image of Tony is there. If it is there, maybe it is not there. Then there is listening. But if the image is there of Tony as an authority, as this or that, can one see the impact of that image on the listening, feel it, And how one thinks about it, feels about what is said. Not just listening, but thinking about it and feeling about it. In terms of tone and me as, what does one see oneself as? Let it come to light. A student, a newcomer, an old hand, someone who knows. Or can one sit there listening as nobody, as nothing? And not make something out of the one who is talking. So that there can be intimate communication. between you and me, not as a you and a me, but just communicating, listening together, looking together at this tremendous problem of authority. Authority meaning attributing power, truth, whatever to the person to whom one is listening. And the feeling that goes with it, it must be right, I must remember it, I must follow it, I must do as she says or as I think she says. And 
Sometimes that isn't even noticed, this implication that, no, I have to say that clearly. In listening, one doesn't realize that one attributes things to what is said that are not said. Things are said, but it's not said, do that. Or if you don't do that, you're bad. just wondering about listening, whether it's possible to listen together, not to an authority, but to what goes on in us, which is being pointed out, what is pointed out may be false, so can one test it in oneself, to see for oneself what what is going on in oneself in listening is so, as it was said, or is not so. It's all right and maybe helpful for somebody to point things out, but to see whether this is so, whether this is actually going on, can only happen here, 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 in each individual human being. No one can see for another or listen for another. This is, on the one hand, the unfortunate thing. On the other hand, this is the beauty of it all. That there is freedom in each one of us to see and look and understand for ourselves. By the word for ourselves, I don't mean for the sake of a self, but here, right here, in this human being. Because the listening and understanding is the clearest when there isn't this tremendous occupation by the sense of self. which is also something to, f to be found out by each one of us. Not to believe or to fight when it's said, but to, to wonder about it. I can remember all through my questioning life, like at the time I was questioning and wondering, beset by tremendous doubts, There was here and there a statement read, or a way of putting things that I read that startled the mind. Sometimes even shocked it. What, what could this person mean? Where is he coming from? How could one say a thing like that? And yet not reject it, not fight it, just leave it sit there someplace. The brain has all kinds of different files. Which are not totally inactive. Particularly to the extent that one is really startled if one fights it all away, or argues it away, reasons it away, then there's no active file. That will pop up at a moment. Is that what that meant? Or oh, this is what was meant by it. And not just is that what was meant by just grinding and nagging? What did this person mean? What is, what is the meaning of this statement? I won't subscribe to it, but I won't reject it either. I will. We can discuss it together. Look at it in a meeting that's what meetings are for, one 
one way one can use meetings to bring up something that sounds so strange or so impossible. One may even be angry about it. And yet bring it up, we'll look at it. We'll look at the anger too if necessary, at everything. We can look at everything. We have 10 minutes. <laughs> <clears throat> Not very much. <laughs> In meetings outside of retreat, we have 50 minutes sometimes. It goes to an hour. That's a little bit more leisurely pace. But we, we don't have that in a retreat. And yet, the whole pace of the seven days is very leisurely. And that's why it's possible within the leisurely pace of a week to just have an intensive 10 minutes tried it out in the last retreat, and it worked. One can question a lot of things in 10 minutes and look at a lot of things, and also be silent. Silence takes no time. If it's there, So can one listen to a talk, which is not a lecture, sometimes people refer to it, at it as your daily lecture. I don't see it as a lecture, lectures in which I impart information from here to there, from a storage of, storehouse of, of information to be stored in the receiving brain. Because you could say, wait a minute, you just talked about an, an active file. That's different. It's not something one <clears throat> stores in order to repeat it or regurgitate it, hold on to it, just to keep, to keep in a state of upheaval about it or turmoil or agitation. All of these words don't quite describe it. Unfinished business. Not understanding. And yet keep it alive. This not understanding. By which I'm not saying everything that is being said is obscure. I try to be clear. But I'm not always clear in the expression. Maybe I don't see something clearly. That's why you can discuss it. You say that that sounded confusing to me or confused. Don't be afraid that I'll be offended. I'll not be offended. You say, well, how do you know that? Well, I know it from the past. Maybe today or tomorrow I'll be offended. <laughs> but that's something to look at, isn't it? take offense as something that befalls us, like a sickness. We have to endure it. Oh, strike out, put blame on others, or beat ourselves. But why not look at what, what offense is? Why do I feel offended, angry, afraid? This is what this work is all about to get to the root of it. Not take anything for granted because it has always happened. It's going to continue to happen. And there's a reason for it happening. But I stay with my hurt. Nurture it. Nurse it. I want to find out why do I get hurt and plummet. Dive into it. Sit with it. Not fight it. See the fighting and put that aside because that does not help to see. And escape doesn't either. Self-defense, protection doesn't help to understand hurt. But when self-protection or defense takes place, then that's the first thing to look at because that's what's now operating. With a 
is simple. What is this? What is going on? Not already knowing about it from all the books one has read or courses one has taken, conversations and dialogues one has had with people, but afresh as this, this whole drama is unfolding right now in this mind or between us in relationship. It's so difficult. Particularly in our daily life, in a retreat, there may be some simplicity to it, to it because, as we said before, we are moving in a very vast, silent listening space together, listening and looking space, in which energy is not dissipated in our usual way of dealing with problems. Just because I say that I'm not an authority, don't want to be your authority, not to assume that this isn't happening anyways, that one makes her into an authority. It happens. It's given in our past, in our past conditioning, in the setup here. Which we haven't been able to change, we haven't come up with any different setup, which is as good as this one. One person sitting and people sitting around listening. One person talking. So everything from our past and from this present setup may trigger this whole authority pattern or teacher student pattern that we've lived with, been conditioned in for centuries, millennia. And yet, what we're investigating here is that very pattern of establishing authority and wondering whether the mind can free itself from that pattern and look for itself, question and find out albeit together with someone if the 10 minutes are there or the 45 minutes of a talk seven times a week without making something out of that person who does the talking and the questioning together. Someone told me recently or mentioned it someplace, that I am an expert on authority. This is double now, isn't it? This last book that came out, in working with the editor, that was the thing that he felt and the publishing house felt should be right in the beginning of the book. And the book was all uh, rearranged to put everything that deals with authority in the beginning. Because this is what was felt, is what interests people right now. This is what people are struggling with, spiritual authority, authority and spiritual teachers, and the following of it, of spiritual teachers, without looking and thinking for oneself. So this is why this was all rearranged. I, I did not demand that. That's what the publisher wanted to do. The whole book was his baby. Does that now give the feeling that here is the person who is the expert on authority? Just as important to look at hurt, at trust, all these other chapters that are in there. Not just read about it in the book, but observe it in oneself as it happens, and we get hurt every day. 
and hurt each other every day. And are afraid of each other and threaten each other. Subtly or grossly. Who's going to help us out in our moment-to-moment -moment living alone and with each other? And that's what we're, what we're interested in here, to see whether we can bring about or whether there can come about in each one of us a free spirit of inquiry, of looking, for oneself, not knowing it, starting with not knowing, keeping knowledge in abeyance to find out freshly, not through the layers and layers of accumulated know-how and expertise, but in a sort of innocent new way. Is that possible? If that's possible, and I say it is, but I want to convince you, you have to find out for yourself. If that's indeed taking place, then our relationship of working together doesn't have the, the aspect of authority and the fear of and respect for authority. But the fragrance of, of friendliness of mutuality, looking at common problems together. Which we all share in, not just in this hall, in this country, in this century or in this year or day, but these problems that we seem so unable to see through and put aside have beset human beings maybe since the beginning of time. Who knows? Certainly since recorded history. Problems of fear, loneliness, wanting. Defense defense alliances and aggression. Finding security in groups, small and large, and then submitting to the group the autonomy of thinking and seeing clearly for oneself. Going along, even if there's an inkling things aren't quite all right, going along with it because this is where my protection lies, my safety. My pleasure. The topics that thoughts come out of or evolve in are usually questions or things that people bring up in meetings. They are reworded in such a way as not to expose someone. They are also not worded verbatim because I'm not capable of remembering verbatim and have often no time between 
one person leaving and the next one coming in to write something down or maybe just jot down a word. Then it may turn out the next person has a very similar question. So when, by the time the question comes up in a talk, it's sort of a combination of many questions or a rewording of one that that can be used for looking together because it is common. One may say, well, this is not my problem. But can one listen anyways? This afternoon it may be one's problem. And also, as long as something ails one of us, doesn't it ail all of us? Because we're not separate from each other, we have built up a thousands and thousands of year old belief system that we are separate, that we are independent agents who know what we're doing at least a little bit, who have freedom of choice. And with that we separate ourselves from each other. And with the separation comes loneliness and also antagonism, polarities, you versus me, us versus them. It's everywhere. It's, it's observable in oneself, in one's small scale relationships and the moment the news is turned on or the paper is looked at, there it is globally. Everywhere. Defense, separation, aggression. Fear, tremendous fear, tremendous suffering. people getting hurt who were not even involved in that particular skirmish, getting hurt nonetheless because they were there in proximity, happens everywhere. So we can look at any one problem together because it's ours if it is one person's. With which I'm not putting pressure on people to come here. It's not a command. It's an invitation. And yet, it's, it's respected if someone says, I, I need some space from all of this talking about problems. Fine. If you do have a question which you wish to be left untouched in a talk, then please let me know and I will respect that. If you have a question about a question that was raised, please feel free to bring it up. Yeah. So many inhibitions we have thinking, what is she going to think about me that I didn't understand this during the talk? Maybe she'll think I'm stupid. Oh, it's, it's great if one really grapples with a problem and brings it up again and again. Sometimes people say, I don't know what you're going to think of me. I still haven't seen through this. I still have this problem. I hate to waste your time with it all the time. You must be getting 
that's how people put it. I know how you put up with it or so. It's not like that. If you approach it freshly, I'll approach it freshly. It isn't the old problem, because it's now. It's a new day, washed by lots of rain. What happens too with many people, whether one has been here before or not, waiting in the solarium for one's turn. We, we used to call that a waiting line, but we, we dropped that word because one doesn't need to wait. One, one can just sit there with what's there. It's the most beautiful view out of those little windows. It's not too hot. Oh, maybe not the most beautiful view inwardly, but to sit with it, and then when the time comes to come in, that's one's turn. So can one look at what this whole thing of waiting, what that involves? This was just parenthetically said. What I began to say was, sitting in the solarium, because one's group is up for meetings, heart may start to pound the closer one gets to the, to the place where one, it's one's next turn. It confounds a lot of people. Why, why does this happen? Particularly if one has been here before and has found out there's nothing to be afraid of. There's no uh, fearful thing going on. In the room one isn't put to the test or whatever. So, the heart pounds, so let's listen to a pounding heart. What does it sound like? What does it feel like? Maybe some associations come up. Reminds me of waiting in front of the principal's office. Or doctor's office to be di diagnosed, maybe with a bad disease or so. So to allow the mind to unfold in the, in the midst of a pounding heart and the discomfort of a, of a pounding heart, to sit with the whole thing and the rain splashing on the, on the deck. There's nothing right or wrong about feeling fear or excitement, upset, as long as we don't make a problem out of it. Complicating it by thinking, I shouldn't feel this way right now, I wish I felt differently. This is when the problem starts. The fact that fear has been triggered so quickly, that's a fact. Here it is. What is it? I can't look at it and listen to it if I really think I shouldn't feel that way. Or if the why do I feel that way is not a real inquiring question, but more of an exclamation in, in despair or exasperation. But you, you start with where you leave off. If there's exasperation, then what is that? There's nothing is not worth looking at and listening to with gentleness, not with a sword in one's hand to cut it off. Feelings and Emotions can't be eliminated by being cut off. I think we all know that intellectually, maybe experientially. What's the very root of it? And in digging for the root, even of a dandelion or a tree one wishes to transplant, one has to go into the dirt into dark dirt. It's not set as a value judgment. It's a fact. To dig up a dandelion or a tree, the, the clean white fingernails go, unless one wears gloves, but then you don't feel the root. 
and you feel the, the sweaty inside of a glove. Are we into digging in the dirt where it's dark? Little light to start with. Maybe no light, just digging in the dark, like a blind man or woman. I may be already saying too much because someone may say, as I sit there, I don't feel like digging. Everything is very peaceful, quiet. It's not a command to dig. This afternoon something may happen that beckons for some digging, but at the moment, if there's the, the quietness of the, just a few drops now, the cool air, the mind not bothered by anything, Is there someone who is enjoying it? Who is beginning to make a little report about it in the mind? Because then there's division. The Me having that and the problem starts. Wanting to keep it, fearing to lose it. Becoming somebody special in this gallery of images that we cultivate are attached to about ourselves. So we're not saying what anybody should do here. Someone asked me that, what is the purpose here? What is the goal? To look at what's there this instant, if that's possible we're carried away by our fears or desires and there's just that, dreaming, fantasizing and emoting. But maybe there can be an instant of waking up to the fact that this is going on. Fantasizing, emoting, dreaming, fearing. What is that? What is it right now, this instant? Stopping to, to look and listen and touch all of that that's going on without knowing what it all is. Is there a purpose in that, a goal? See, we're questioning the whole purpose and goal trip too. What that does to a human being, how it divides us up in time between being here now in our imperfect state, and eventually the goal of reaching a perfect state, which is our human calamity of division in time and space between what's going on now, which is not attended to, and what is projected and is desired to attain in the future. thought being instrumental in creating time, the time in which I will be perfect, whole, complete. What am I now, this instant, when there's no worry about time, the next moment, tomorrow or yesterday, just now, what is going on? moment of wondering, do I know or is that just, huh, what is it? Doesn't need the words even. And we're not saying don't use thoughts, thoughts are bad and so forth. Thoughts are there in unceasing abundance. <laughs> it 
can thoughts think intelligently out of looking and seeing what's actually there? We will end here for today.